I'm a feminist, but... <laughs> well back, baby! Yeah. And I'm a feminist, but uh, I don't have two spatial skills to rub together. You know that thing, oh, women, do, women don't know directions. I really don't know directions. If there are any men in, like, oh, women can't know where they're going. Yes, that is me. To the extent that this evening, I went for a little wander into Brighton, and I got so lost, I could not find the dome, <laughs> the pavilion. And I was, I was slightly panicked, because I've got to get back, I've got to get back. And I, and I thought, I'll have to ask someone for directions. So I asked two young women, and they went, oh my God, we're coming to see you tonight. <laughs> Big shout out to uh, Morgan and Sadie. <laughs> see, I wasn't telling a lie. What I'm saying is without feminism tonight, I would not be here. <laughs> this would just be a pool of light. They took me back home. I am a feminist, but... <laughs> I once got carried off stage by a six foot seven Irish boxer gentleman without me asking him to do that, and he carried me round the room, and I have never felt more like a princess in my whole life. <laughs> oh, I hope there's photos. I am a feminist, but. Woo! There has to be an easier way. Um, to get a weekend in Brighton. <laughs> Not an easier way to get a paid one. No. I'm a feminist, but... <laughs> that doesn't mean I hate men. Some of my best friends are men that I hate. Hey! Name them, I bet they're all comedians. They are. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but... <laughs> Even though I try and be body positive, I have been so influenced by the music of the early 90s, at uh, the early 2000s, sorry, that um, whenever I see someone with a small bra size, I can't help thinking, look at the depressed are small and humble, so it'll confuse them with the mountains. Damn you, Shakira! <laughs> I'm a feminist, but, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but um, I apologise all the time. For everything. And I, but because I've let go of shame about being wrong about stuff. And I think people should. You know, because everybody's wrong about everything all the time on the internet. And I think, honestly, I think there are some bits of privilege. Privilege is made up of things that everybody should get away with and things that nobody should. And I think never, ever, ever admitting when you've just been a bit of a dick is something nobody should get away with. So, like, I'm always saying sorry and I'm fine with it. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but... <laughs> Last week when I had a big delivery of firewood for my log burner, don't hate me because you ain't me, uh, I couldn't carry it in the house, and my big macho burly neighbour came and offered some help, and I have never felt straighter in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a moment, Grace, where you thought, I could... It was that I could or I would. I thought this is a man I'd cross the floor for. Hey! <laughs> Live from the Brighton Dome, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Zoe Lyons, and our very special guests, Jessica Hines, Sakisa, Laurie Penny, Grace Petrie, and Jess Robinson. <laughs> That's right, I've got a feminist cape. Backstage, Zoe Lyons said, I'm quite jealous of that cape. Grace Petrie said, why do you wear a cape? I said, I find they don't ask for their money back if I wear a cape. <laughs> they say those production values, we can see where the money's gone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Divided in a socialist fashion between all the comedians and this cape. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so welcome, welcome Brighton. And by welcome Brighton, I do mean in the room, not on the Zoom. <laughs> We're back. Oh, I'm so nice to be back. I would love to hug each and every one of you, but I believe that's still illegal. Actually, it's not. It's not. Because I think after Partygate, Boris Johnson went, eh, can't really be one rule for us and one rule for them. So now it's no rules for anyone. Probably inadvisable. 
This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and our hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. That's right. That's the only way I can say undermine them now. I don't know what happened. I don't know when it started. Someone could go back and listen to the recordings and see how it happened. We don't know. We don't know. We just know it's evolved and we're happy that it has. You, sir, thank you very much for coming. Excellent. I pointed to two men in the front row and one of them nodded and now he's mine. Um, He's still making direct eye contact with me. It's his own fault. What's your name? Chris. Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello. Uh, Do you listen to The Guilty Feminist? No. No. Has somebody brought you here? Who's brought you? This is my wife, Rachel. Your wife. Okay. Now, I suspect that your wife has brought you here because she wants you to learn something. (laughs) The way I know that is she's bought tickets for the front row. She's given you a little panel, a little pen, and then said, take notes. Uh, Chris, would you identify as a feminist? I mean, just look around, Chris. Look around you. They're going to turn. They're going to turn, Chris. It's just a numbers game for you tonight, Chris, here. It's just a numbers game. But what I love is the confidence of a man in this environment to hesitate. Because if I feel if I'd snuck into a men's rights activist conference, you know, for my own reasons, and someone pointed me, when are you a men's rights activist? I'd be like, yes, I am. Oh, yes, I fucking am. Yes, indeed, all about the men. I just can't wait to get them more rights than they've already got. Oh, there's not enough rights in my opinion. I would never hesitate. Because I would feel the danger, Chris. I would feel the danger of the encroaching crowd. Chris, just to say, and you may feel like I don't want to own that mantle because I'm a man and can I really say I'm a feminist? Maybe I'm more of an ally. Maybe that was what was going through your mind. It was. It was, Chris? Yes. (laughs) Well done. And can you see how I've helped Chris out there? Because I want to build a bridge. I'm a bridge builder. I'm a bridge builder. Was that what was genuinely going through your mind, Chris? Oh, yes. (laughs) It's almost too enthusiastic now, Chris. Dial it back, dial it back. Um, Rachel, do you listen to the podcast? Yes. He said her name was Rachel, by the way. This is not me. I'm not doing a Darren Brown here. I, I, I was aware at the time I didn't repeat it. But I, 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 uh, now you look like a plant. I don't, you're not a plant, are you? I've never met you before either. That sound, now, now it looks like I have. It's really getting awkward at this point. You listen to the podcast? Yes. And why did you bring Chris? Did you rather than have a sort of girls' night out, you thought? Uh, because we've had two years of not doing anything, so I thought... We've had two years of not doing anything, so this is literally better than nothing. (laughs) Rachel, I hear you. I hear you. I'd go to Jimmy Carr at this point. (laughs) Listen, if it was playing in my town around the corner from me, it was a short walk. Was it a short walk here tonight, Rachel? Was it a walk? No, have you you driven from Hove? (laughs) That's my assumption. I assume there's Hove for Hove people in. Just give us a cheer if you're Hove. Absolutely. That was a that was a smug cheer, wasn't it? Yep. <laughs> bought early, bought big. Yes, I understand. Where have you come from, Rachel? Uh, Hastings. Hastings. Yes. That's commitment to the genre, isn't it? <laughs> She's come from Hastings. You booked a babysitter, or have you parked a car? Like, how's it worked out? We've parked a car. We've booked a babysitter. We've got a hotel for the night. Got a hotel for the night. <laughs> booked a babysitter. Parked the car. Got a hotel tonight. This is just foreplay. <laughs> <laughs> I've realised now. We Absolutely. Didn't make it. What was that? We nearly didn't make it. We nearly didn't make it. Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay. So, 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 I'm very sex positive. Don't get me wrong. I'm very sex positive, but I'm glad that you did make it because it's important to do feminism first, and then it makes you feel like you've earned the orgasm. Isn't that, is that how we all feel, feminists? Yeah. You just put in a bit of feminism, and then you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, we must say tonight, we must say, this is nothing I was going to say, obviously, uh, but we must say tonight, it's International Women's Day week. I feel we need to celebrate that. We get a week now more than a day. We used to get a day. I feel like now it's more of a week, and I'm very delighted about that. Um, I've had some people this week saying, you know, like, is it appropriate to celebrate? Maybe we should say we're going to commune or whatever, because... You know, the world news is just awful and it feels really awful. And my response to that is, I think we're obliged to celebrate. I think we have 
to come together and have a good time tonight. Because this here tonight, what we're doing here in the Brighton Dome, is refueling our tank. Because there's a lot to do, gang. There's a lot to do. And sometimes it feels like there's so much to do, it's impossible. It's the world's getting out of hand. There's a pandemic. Then there's uh, floods. There's a cyclones. There's a war. It feels like the horsemen of the apocalypse are circling, and there's far more than advertised. You know what I'm saying? There are there's now 17. My mother and my mother was saying to me in a text, you know, what were the biblical plagues again? She was like, I think I fit. She said in Australia we've had locusts, we've had floods, we've had we've had. Uh, you know, I was like rivers of blood. Uh, I said I would I'd be drawing like a little cross on the sacrifice a sheep and draw a cross over the over your house tonight. Um, we had a very religious background. I realise that some of this isn't landing as much with you. It is here. Is it? Is, is here. Just give us a cheer if you had a religious background. Yeah. Give us a cheer if you're a Jehovah's Witness and that's why you're drawn to me. Yeah. <laughs> what? Chris and Rachel, you were Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh my God, this has totally taken a turn. The rest of you can leave. We're going to reminisce. Wow, wow. Because, you know, sometimes, Chris... If I'm chatting to a man in the audience, I'll say, you know, I used to be a Jehovah's Witness. There are scarier ways to meet me. <laughs> but in your case, no. You... Now, let me guess. I reckon I can tell what you were. Oh. I think... I don't think you're an elder, but I think you're a ministerial servant. Oh, an you're an elder. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, this adds an extra layer for me. When I asked you if you were a feminist, if you're just an average guy walking down the street, you're allowed to pause. If you were an elder... You're a fucking feminist now, my friend. You're making up. Making up for the patriarchy with which, with which you were also held in the patriarchy. I understand that. You were also controlled. But also, you were an elder. So I need you to be doing at least four to five hours of feminism a week now, Chris. Because I was in that religion and it wasn't a feminist space. Okay. You were an elder. What were, which kind of elder were you? Like, were you like a presiding overseer? Or what, what, what job did you have? I was a secretary. Secretary. Women, women are not allowed to do anything. I think that's more like Secretary of State rather than takes notes. Or is it takes notes? Secretary of State. It's what? It was like Secretary of State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to know all the secrets. Afterwards, you'll be coming backstage and telling me everything you know. <laughs> all of the inside information. Um, so what... Yeah, I, I've got distracted by this, but what I wanted to say... <laughs> what I wanted to say is this. Um, uh, lately, I've been thinking that life can only be lived in moments. Sometimes I like to check, is it still now? Yes, it's still now. Is it still now? It's still now. It's still, is it still now? It, now? It's still now. Guys, what I worked out recently is that it's always now. And when I say this to you, I have to admit, a couple of weeks ago I went up a mountain and did three ayahuasca ceremonies. <laughs> So it may be, if you don't know what that is, it's a Peruvian tea that gives you hallucinations that's healing your trauma. When you come down, you say things like, guys, that's still now. <laughs> I've promised my friends this will wear off, but I'm not sure it will. Um, but here's the thing. I, I started to think about how life can only be lived in moments. That's all it can be. There is really no past. It's just some things happened and we make meaning of those things. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but there is a now. And so I, was, I, I do stuff with Amnesty. You, know, you guys know I do stuff. I'm an Amnesty ambassador. And I was hearing a story recently where there was a political prisoner and he was held for 20 years in a godforsaken jail. But he said every day I would get out of bed defiantly and I would live with hope and know that I had this army out there because people were writing through Amnesty International to me and about me to the government. And so I thought, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. There are people trying for me. And he said, if I just knew I was forgotten in some hellhole, I couldn't have carried on. But I never collapsed. I always felt like, yeah, someone's fighting for me. And, my, and my, my stay in this jail has meaning because I'm a political prisoner and people are seeing it and it's causing people to look at this government. And he said, that's what kept me going. And I thought about that and I thought, there are political prisoners who die in jail and we write all the letters and we do all the campaigns and they die. Have we failed? I would argue no. I would argue we failed to get them out of jail but that was an outcome. Life is lived in moments. And I would say 
that we succeeded in making every moment of that person's stay in captivity better. All we've got is moments. Can we stop Putin going into Ukraine and doing terrible things? No. But can we make a moment better? Some moments better for some people who are in Ukraine now. Some moments better for people who are at the border who can't get out. Some moments for people who are being treated badly as Ukrainian citizens and residents because they're black. Can we make those moments better? So I would ask you tonight and over the next week and over the next year to think in moments, not outcomes. The outcome we can't control and the outcome isn't everything. It's just one moment far away. The now is what we have. So tonight, in this now, we celebrate, we laugh, we hold each other, if it's legal and you know the person, we, <laughs> and we sing along and we fuel each other's batteries because this now is for that so that tomorrow's now can be to make someone else's life a little bit better. Are you with me? It's the only way I know not to get discouraged right now. Um, let's let go of outcomes and let's start thinking about moments and what we can do in each and every one of them. And that brings me to my first brilliant comedian of the night. I really want you to get to know her because I know we're going to be having her on The Guilty Feminist more. Uh, she's schlepped here to Brighton tonight, so you've got to give her a really big welcome. Not that it's a schlep, but there is a train strike, guys. Um, you will have seen her on the BBC. You will have seen her on ITV. But it's the first time you've seen her on the big GF. Put your hands together and make incredible guilty feminists welcoming woohooing noises for the incredible Sakisa! Brighton! How are we doing, Brighton? I'm so excited to be here for this feminist party. Very excited. Because I love partying and drinking. It's one of the things I actually love to do. Anyone else? I love it because I feel like in the UK we've got a drinking culture wouldn't you agree yeah. not problem culture <laughs> yeah because we use any excuse to have a drink don't we like yay it's sunny let's have a drink or yay I'm pregnant let's have a drink <laughs> you know there's some parties that I don't like though like whenever I get a wedding invitation in a post I look at it like it's a tax bill <laughs> like how much is this going to cost me now <laughs> Because it's not just like one party, is it? There's several parties when it comes to weddings. There's the stag hen do, there's actual wedding reception, there's the after party or divorce party, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it's also, you've got to think about what you're going to wear, how you're going to get there, what gift you're going to give that person. And also, whenever I go to a wedding, I really hate it when there's no open bar. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. yeah, the sound of recognition, yeah. <laughs> whenever that happens and there's no open bar, I'm like, okay. No open bar. Let me just take back my envelope back. So there you go. Back in the pocket it goes. I probably hate weddings because normally it's me that gets pushed in front of the bouquet at a family wedding. It's normally my granddad does this. She's like, you get the bouquet. You're single, old and alone. You grab the bouquet. And I'm just like it. How would she like it if I did that to her? Like we're at a funeral and we're throwing dirt on the grave. And I go to her, you get in there, you're single, old and alone. No! You wouldn't like it, no. It's because I'm the only child, so not the favourite child, the only child. And all my family are very desperate for me to have kids. Like, my mum kept saying to me over Christmas, oh, Sakisa, all your friends have got kids. And I was like, not on purpose. <laughs> She said to me, your cousin and her husband are trying for a baby. And I just said to her, that just means they're having sex over and over again. And if you want me to be doing that, I've been doing that since I was 18 years old. I just know how to use a condom. Okay. Uh. But my mum and my grand are not the worst ones in my family. My cousin's the worst one in my family. She's a bitch. Um, she's nine years old. <laughs> Bitch, she's a bitch. Oh, she's always 
in my business, always in my business. Like we was at one particular family wedding and she kept going to me, why do you not have a boyfriend? You're over the age of 30. You should be walking on that hour. What's wrong with you? I was like, you're nine years old. Where's your boyfriend? Where are you coming at me for? What's going on? What's the beef? Yeah. And it got to like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And I had maybe like three or four bottles of Prosecco. Because <laughs> I was living my best life, wasn't I? Yeah. And she kept going around in a circle going, you don't have a boyfriend. You don't have a boyfriend. And I was like, you know what? I know how to handle you. So I was just like, you don't know your daddy. You don't know your daddy. Fuck her. Teach them when they're young. Teach them when they're young. Okay. Don't mess with me. I'm from South London. Okay. Don't mess with me. <laughs> but I was very excited to come out of the pandemic because I wanted to celebrate life and the fact that I've got a tight vagina. Hey, Chris. Hey. <laughs> hey, babe. Hey. So I wanted to celebrate life. So I decided I was gonna throw myself my favorite type of party, which is a house party. It's my favorite type of party in the world. And if you don't know the first rule of a good house party, it's not to set it in your own house. <laughs> so I set man in my best friend's house. <laughs> There's two reasons why I sell it in my best friend's house. The first reason is because she was moving out of her flat the two days after they scheduled a house party and she had just got back her deposit. So we were fucking the place up. Yeah. The second reason is because I've just paid off my own mortgage off my own flat. Woo! Thank you. So I didn't want anyone else to be in my flat apart from my parents that still live there. Okay. <laughs> We were very excited about this house party. We went full out with the food. We had six different types of chicken that includes jerk chicken, barbecue chicken, wings, it's separate. We had curry chicken, we had stew chicken, we had chicken for that vegan that was coming. Chicken for that one fucking vegan that was coming. Her name was Hannah, fuck Hannah. She also turned up to my house party on time. Who does that? I didn't even turn up to my own house party on time. We also had curry, goat, fish, rice and peas, macaroni, pie, salad, coleslaw. We went full out with the food and we were very excited. But we looked at the guest list and realised we needed some more diversity. So we invited five white people. <laughs> but what happened was the two white people I invited decided they was going to bring bread, hummus and blue cheese. <laughs> Do you know what was left at the end of the party? Bread, hummus and blue cheese. Take your shit with you. Come in my house party, eat my shit. No. I've never seen anyone packing their Tupperware at the end of a house party blue cheese. No. <laughs> We're all very excited about this house party, but what had happened was it got to about midnight, 12.30 at night, and I was getting a bit sweaty because everyone was dancing in the living room. It got a bit packed. So I decided I was going to get myself an ice cream from the kitchen. I'm in the kitchen eating my ice cream and my best friend's cousin, Jerome, approaches me. Now, Jerome is what I call a fuck boy. Is there any fuck boys in the room? <laughs> if you don't know what a fuck boy is, a fuck boy is someone who is sliding your DMs at 1am being like, are you up? A fuck boy is someone who will plan your whole future with you but has no intention to see you the next day. A fuckboy is surrounded, is surrounded with red flags, but the person they date is like, that's not red flags, that's burgundy. That is a fuckboy, okay. So I'm very, well, it's very wary and approach me. So I'm eating my ice cream, he comes up to me, he goes, are you enjoying your ice cream? I'm like, yes, I'm enjoying my ice cream. He's like, are you sure you're enjoying your ice cream? I'm like, yes, I'm sure I'm enjoying my ice cream. And he said, I wanted to ask this question because I wanted to let you know that my cream would taste better. you know? <laughs> How the fuck do you know? <laughs> I'm not going to go on a rant about men. I said this earlier. I am a feminist. That doesn't mean I hate men. I just think men have this weird entitlement at this moment in time. And it, this is why I probably don't date because everything nowadays is on a dating app. And I've tried the dating apps. I tried them all. Tinder, Bumble, Grindr, LinkedIn, Uber Eats. Tried them all. Um, <laughs> Uber Eats was my favourite, okay. Um, <laughs> tried them all, but I hate the dating apps. 
because of one reason. It's an epidemic that's going on. I don't know if you know about this epidemic. The epidemic that I'm talking about is dick pics. It is an epidemic. Men send them out willy-nilly, no pun intended. Okay? <laughs> Men send them out like that Oprah up in here, like, you get dip it, you get dip it, you get dip it, you get dip it. If you look on your seat right now, there's probably a dip it. We all get dip it. And I came off the dating app for this one reason, because I had a day which I called Dip Pick Friday. Which is exactly what it sounds like. Like I signed up on the dating app to match with someone. Hey, how you doing? How's your day? Dip pick. Okay, let's try someone else. Hey, how you doing? What do you do for a living? Dip pick. I accumulated 25 dip picks in one day. Now, I don't understand the concept of dip picks, men, not all men, but men. I don't understand what you expect my response to be like. Just dip pick? <gasps> for me? Oh! Look at it, it's so pretty. Oh! But men, not all men, but men. <laughs> what you don't seem to understand is when you send out a dip pic, you don't just send me a dip pic. <laughs> you send me and the close circle of friends I'm with a dip pic, okay? We trade them like they're Pokemon cards. <laughs> so what happens now is, Whenever I do get sent a dip pic, what I just do is send them one back. <laughs> Can you tell if this is your dick? I don't know. But I'm not going to blame men. I can't just blame men because I think that women that date men, we have to take some responsibility with that because we give our men so much encouragement in the bedroom. We're just like, oh my God, it's so big. Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, you're killing me. Please don't kill me. Oh my God. <laughs> to the point where I'm sure men wake up in the morning, look at their penis and they're like, more people need to see this. I'll tell you a couple more things before I go. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm not originally from this country. I'm originally from Barbados. The lights went out just then. <laughs> oh my God, immigration's come to get me. Oh, crap. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, not, I'm from Barbados. And if you, don't, if you don't know that, Barbados has recently become independent from the Queen. We were very excited in Barbados. We threw a party. Rihanna got a medal. <laughs> For singing? I don't know. But you can tell from my accent, I do not have a Barbados accent. That's because I've been living in the UK for a very long time, to the point where I now have got a British passport. If anyone wants a British passport, I'm going to tell you how you get one. You've got to do this thing called a Life in the UK test. Anyone heard of it? Yeah. If you've never heard of it, please look online. It is a very bad pub quiz. <laughs> and I know this because I attempted to do it four times, been originally from Barbados, and I failed it four times. And that is interesting for me because I'm an immigration lawyer. <laughs> That used to mean my goddamn day job. So what I'm saying, people, is if you want a British passport, come find me. I've got four of my drawers that are £100 each, OK? Because <laughs> I'm a hustler, damn right, I'm a hustler, OK? <laughs> people love to talk to me about immigration, that immigration is a problem in this country, that immigrants just come over here stealing all our jobs. And I'm like, when was the last time you was at a kebab shop thinking, yes, you stole my job? <laughs> You're not thinking that, are you? No. And I generally have been thinking about immigration for the last 18 months, especially during the pandemic and everything that's going on recently. Because I generally think that if an immigrant wants to come to this country, they should be entitled to come to this country. But if an immigrant wants to stay, I think they should then challenge a British person for their citizenship. <laughs> Let's make some trade, shall we? I'm calling it a border exchange program. Okay. <laughs> Because to be honest,
honest with you, a lot of people love to stereotype me. It's one of the things that they actually love to do. Especially, I don't understand why it still happens. It's 2022. A lot of people actually don't believe on an immigration solicitor because of the way that I talk and the way that I dress. People just love to make assumptions about me, because, especially because I'm from South London. And it's really annoying. Like Even the other day, I was having this conversation with this man, and he was like, where are you from? And I was like, London. He was like, no, no. Where is your home? Because your name is Sikisa. And I was like, oh, okay. So you want to know about my cultural background? So I tell you. So I was born to a mother from Barbados, and I'm the only child, and yes, I was named after an African queen, because why the fuck not? <laughs> Just because I talk like this doesn't mean I'm a recipe for jerk chicken, okay? Just because everyone you know sounds like you has a name that you can pronounce like a conservative MP or Daily Mail journalist, it doesn't work like that anymore. Yes, I'm a woman that has free jobs, my own car, my own mortgage, and I still got money in the bank because I'm a boss, bitch. <laughs> Yes, I still live on a council estate because a council estate doesn't provide drug dealers now. They provide lawyers, doctors and engineers. And before you do ask, yes, I do know who my dad is. <laughs> and he was like, oh gosh, no, um, no, um, mm, no, um, I just wanted to know where your home is because I'm your taxi driver. I was like, fine. <laughs> that is a speech wasted. <laughs> Uh, guys, thank you so much for having me. If you liked me, uh, thanks. Oh, thanks. Hands already. Thanks. If you liked me, you can follow me on Instagram. It is Twix Comedy. Twix like the chocolate. Don't ask. It's not because of this. Okay. <laughs> but let me get this out of the way right now. I'm not called Twix because I like two fingers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I prefer Kit Kat. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> and I don't like to take breaks. Hey, Chris. Hey. Uh, enjoy the Cheers, I've been mean, Sikisa. Cheers. Sikisa, everybody! Follow her everywhere, including to the Edinburgh Fringe, where you can see her show. Hello, Guilty Feminists, it's Deborah. I am going to be at my favourite ever venue, Vicar Street, Dublin, with Alison Spittle on the 14th of March. And we've got some incredible guests lined up as well. So get your tickets now. On the 20th of March, we are in Oxford with Sarah Keyworth, Athena Kablenu, Celia AB and Grace Petrie. So get your tickets now for that. And the tour continues throughout the spring and summer. We are coming somewhere near you. So look at our website now to find out when and where. On the 21st of March... We are doing a Guilty Feminist episode with Millie Bobby Brown from Stranger Things at Enola Home. What? Susan McComa is co-hosting. Sadly, tickets are sold out, but we will be releasing a few more closer to the date. So if you want to be first in line for tickets, join our Patreon. If you want to be second in line for those tickets, join our mailing list. To do that, go to guiltyfeminist.com and go to the About page. On the 22nd of March at King's Place, we are doing the only podcast and the only live show with Hannah Gadsby, where she's talking about her book, 10 Steps to the Net. It's just going to be her and me in conversation. So get your tickets now for that. That's going to sell out really, really fast. On the 31st of March, Campus Springtime, which was Campus Christmas, we've got an incredible lineup, including me and Tom Allen hosting and Self Esteem, plus many brilliant others. If you've got a ticket for Campus Christmas, it's automatically been transferred. If you want a ticket, go to our website. There's not many left. From the 26th of April to the 7th of May, I am doing the Guilty Feminist Stands Up at Soho Theatre. This is a show about me coming out and going in. Uh, the original run at Soho Theatre sold out and the Women of the World show has sold out. So if you want to see the stand-up show, book a ticket now for Soho Theatre. In July, I will be in Australia and New Zealand. We'll be touring around with Grace Petrie and some of your very favourite Guilty Feminist co-hosts. So please book now. And you can join Patreon for ad-free episodes and exclusive Zoom hangouts at patreon.com slash guilty feminist. Don't forget to listen to Absolute Power and Media Storm, both brilliant podcasts from the House of the Guilty Feminist. And if you could do us a favour, if you've not subscribed to the Guilty Feminist, just quickly click on that subscribe button now. It really helps us keep the podcast going. And now back to the podcast. 
taken my cape off, not because I didn't think it was fabulous, but because I just wanted to get a quick consultation on my dress in the way that you can in a fitting room. Because when I bought it, I thought it was quite fabulous. And then I looked in the mirror today and I thought, it's a little bit wife at a handmaid's tail. <laughs> See what I mean? It's a bit dowdy. It's a bit dowdy. But it's got this sort of double pocket, which I thought, you know, double pocket, but it's really a muff. Look. <laughs> It's a very low muff. Normally muffs here. Is that, is that why they call it a muff? <laughs> I don't know. But listen, listen, I might as well. So, I mean, the way the world's going, the empire is striking back. I think, you know, get your wife and a handmaid's tail clothes ready. Because if they see you in the dress, they'll be like, yeah, wife. And that's the best one you can be. Don't end up as a handmaid. Or one of the Marthas. Definitely go for this. Is it appealing to you, Chris? <laughs> This is what I was destined for, my friend. I got out. Despite men like you. You're, you've changed, Chris. You've changed. You've changed. He's changed. He's changed. Stop turning on him. He's changed. Don't be mean to Chris. He's changed. Remember when I wasn't allowed to stand on the platform and talk? Because only men could. And I had to sit in the audience and listen to you. It's all changed, Chris, hasn't it? It's all changed. Loving this, by the way, just to be clear, if people are worried for Chris, he is smiling, he's laughing, he's clapping, he may be crying on the inside, we'll never know. <laughs> we'll never know, we'll never know. I, and, I, and I'm never a mean comedian, you know I'm not a mean comedian, but I never have an elder in the front row either. It was a long <laughs> time in that cult, I've never had this before, I'm getting a little high on the power, I must get off the stage. <laughs> Fortunately, our next comedian is a homegrown Brighton girl. That's right, my friends. And she has hit the heady heights. You know her from Spaced, if you're my age. You know her from W1A, if you're young. But you know her because she is absolutely everywhere doing absolutely everything. Put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for the one, the only, the glorious, the joyful, the feminist, Jessica Ho! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Just going to say, if you're ever backstage trying to find your way onto stage, don't follow the voice um, because it's coming out of everywhere. Uh, just follow the signs. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, tonight. I'm not quite sure how or why I've got here. Uh, <laughs> that's a general, a general feeling. Um, uh, but I am from Brighton. Um, I mean, I am. Um, I mean, I'm not, I haven't been living in Brighton for a long time, but I, I, I feel like, I feel like I've spent a significant enough amount of time um, of my childhood in Brighton, um, that I can walk around Churchill Square <laughs> saying, fucking DFLs. <laughs> I feel that I can. I mean, I am a DFL now. Um, I live in Folkestone, which is in... Does anybody know Folkestone? Is anyone here from... Yes. And that's where I, that's where I live now. Um, but yeah, Brighton, I'm kind of like a classic sort of 70s... Brighton kid, you know, you know, my dad got off with my best friend's dad. Um, that's, <laughs> that's pretty standard. Anyone from Brighton will, will definitely, definitely get that joke. Um, uh, I'm, very, I'm very happy tonight because, because I'm from Brighton. There are some people here who, who, who know me. Um, from, you know, my, my life in Brighton. We all went to Dorothy Stringer. Um, so it's, I, I'm going to name check them. <laughs> uh, Sarah Hempstead. Do I get a woo from you, Sarah? Where are you? Whoa, thank you. Um, who said that the last time she saw me at the Dome, I was in the school's concert singing Truly Scrumptious. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Um, and also Tanya Pollard. And the last time I saw you, Tanya Pollard, 
I think we were on a train on the, on the way back from the Grange in Lewis, very drunk, you were very tearful, um, and you tried to open the train door while it was moving. <laughs> I was like, no, Tanya, no, no, get back on. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Yes, she does, yes, I do. <laughs> so it's lovely to have, have them here and be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love Brighton. It's kind of like sort of a magical, amazing place. Um, there are 1,700 of us tonight, feminists. I don't know if there's anyone who here who isn't a feminist. There might be. Maybe they are, but they don't call themselves feminists. Maybe they'd like to be called Jared or Petra. Nonetheless, there's nothing homogenous about being a feminist, nothing. For the people who don't know what homogenous means, it means um, not... This, it means the same, and we're not. We're not all the same. Feminists are not all the same. We do not share the same politics, opinions, values, and tastes. We don't look the same. We don't act the same. We don't speak the same. We don't come from the same backgrounds or the same countries. We don't come from the same class. We don't all agree on what feminism is or isn't. And we're not all on Twitter. We're not all on Facebook. We're not all on Instagram. We're not all optimists or pessimists. We're not all voluptuous, we're not all sexual, we're not all asexual. We don't, all of us, like ice cream. Some of us watch Judge Judy, but unbelievably, there are some people who haven't even heard of it. It's shocking, isn't it? Why are we all here then, and what does it mean to be a feminist? Well, I think we have one thing in common. We are strong. That's it. We are strong. We are strong. And we know that being strong doesn't make us less feminine. It doesn't put us at odds with our natural physiognomy. Because we know the glaring, irrefutable truth that all the glorious ways that we, as women, are strong are exactly the way we were intended to be. We were born strong bred strong and became strong through living in a world that would have us believe that weakness, mental and physical, was a defining characteristic of our gender. That strength, towering, unapologetic, determined, righteous strength was not only undesirable in a woman, but unnecessary. And that is just not true. It's a lie. Every single milestone in all of our thousands of diverse experiences, was there ever a moment when we did not have to be strong? No. Has everything good, worthwhile, meaningful, valuable in our lives come from our strength? Yes. So we come together here to say to women and men who are fighting their personal battles for justice and freedom that we are with you and we are strong. To our sisters in the world who are having the rights over their bodies ripped from them, we are with you and we are strong. To our sisters all over the world fighting to end FGM, we are with you and we are strong. To our sisters in the Middle East, there's particularly a woman, Nadia Murad, who's fighting for the Yazidi people and for her women who were held in sexual slavery. She is so strong. She is unbelievably strong. And we are with you and we are with her and we are strong. So keep on signing up for things, keep on donating. For evil will only triumph when good, strong women do nothing. And we are strong. And just say it with me, and then I'm going to go. Say, we are strong with me. We are strong. 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 I'm going now. Sorry. Thanks very much. The incredible Jessica Hines! And now keep that applause going for the one, the only, the all over the telly, it's Zoe Lance! Oh, good evening.
evening, Brighton Dome. <laughs> Bloody love a gig I can get a bus to. <laughs> it's not the only reason I'm here, but I was very much available. Um, my friend Stephen said to me, you can't get the bus to a gig, babe. She's got your own BBC quiz show. I said, oh, man, I sit up front, near the front, upstairs, like I'm driving it, not a total loser. So... <laughs> Good to be here, good to be out. As Deborah said at the start of the show, it's good to be enjoying each other as human beings, ignoring the news because it is horrible. We have to turn it off at times and it's just too overwhelming. I mean, I turned, I was watching it earlier tonight and I just thought, I can't take any more of this. Paul McCartney is headlining Glastonbury. I thought, <laughs> haven't we suffered enough? <laughs> when will this stop? Do you ever look at these old bastards still jangling away and go, why the fuck are you still doing that? <laughs> if there's one thing I've learned during pandemic is I am really ready and very skilled at doing fuck all. I mean, I am... I am ready to retire. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I think it's a good time to go, do you know what? Let's just do a little bit less, shall we? <laughs> do you ever look at Elton John? 74, still banging away on the old Joanna. It's a fucking multi-millionaire. You think, what are you doing, you plonker? If he hasn't stuck enough away in premium bonds or in a shoebox under his bed by now, what the fuck? I mean... It's not that I'm lazy. It's just, you know, I just I think enough is enough at times. It's, I'd have had a, if I was as talented and as wealthy as Elton John, I'd have had a spreadsheet that would told me exactly when I could stop, right? <laughs> it could even have been mid-song at, you know, <laughs> Sussex Cricket Ground, I'd have been there. <laughs> I remember when Rock was young, me and Susie had so much fun. ka -ching. right, that's it, I'm fucking done. <laughs> I'm off to my villa in Spain, fuck this. He looks like a vajazzled dinner lady, for fuck's sake. It's just... Stop it. I'll leave you with this little bit, though. The way I've been trying to sort of maintain myself during this pandemic, I think a lot of us have gone outside, been outside, and that's the joy of being in this city, isn't it? We've got the seaside and we've got the downs. We're very, very lucky to live here. We, you know, every day I go out, I'm delighted and, and, and feel blessed to live here and in the community that we live in. And uh, the sea swimming saved me during the whole pandemic. That's why I started doing studies, sea swimming. I'm one of those wankers, you'll have seen us. <laughs> the little dry robes. <laughs> My like emperor penguins, just... <laughs> the dry robe clog or curl croc combo, it's... <laughs> Could you be more comfortable? I don't think so. <laughs> go sea swimming. I don't call it wild swimming, because I'm not a fucking salmon. Um, <laughs> going back to the place of my spawning. I am um, just swimming. That's all I'm doing, just Because you do one or two things in water, don't you? Swim or don't swim, that's what you do. <laughs> I don't go to Tesco going, going wild walking. That's what I'm doing, just... <laughs> If you do see swim in Brighton Hope, you'll know that it's predominantly women our age that go in the water. It's largely women. We gather at dawn like bison. <laughs> Near the sea edge. We see steam coming off our ample hides of a morning. <laughs> uh... <sighs> <laughs> I was watching us the other day, very climate aware. And I thought, you know what, I don't think it is global warming that's attributing to sea temperatures rising. <laughs> I thought, I'm sorry, Greta Babes, you've got this one wrong. <laughs> I think what it is, is the actual fact that it's hundreds of menopausal <laughs> and perimenopausal women who are exceptionally warm, <laughs> meeting on a daily basis and then just... nuclear hot rods. It's honestly, it's like Fukushima off the coast of Hove some mornings. I mean, <laughs> the last time I went for a swim, a mackerel actually breached the surface and went, fuck me. <laughs> that is my time. I shall see you later. To enjoy the rest of the show. Thank Sorry, you. Lads, everybody. What a legend she is. Now it's time for your
final act before the interval. And then after that, we're going to come back. We're going to have our fabulous guest, Laurie Penny, on the sofa talking about her new book. And when you hear what it's about, you are going to love it. No, genuinely, I don't always say this about every guest. You listen to the podcast, I don't. But you really are going to love what her book is about. It's so exciting. Um, it's going to be me, Jessica Hines, and Zoe Lyons on that sofa having a deep dive, but also hilarious chat, Chris. Have you learned anything so far? What have you learned? Just to say that I'm a feminist when asked. <laughs> well, you'd be good in a police state, Chris. That's great. All right. Well, we'll come back to you. Maybe in the interval, Chris, you could think of some things you've learned from the content and not just from the worst moment of your life that you've relived over and over and over and over and over again in a loop in your head and so have failed to listen to any of the comedy. Um, just like that, that moment, that moment, why did I pause? Why did I pause? I nearly died. Um, um, we, no, but you can brainstorm with Rachel during the interval about what you've learned and come back to us with something. And I do mean something after the interval. Are you, are you on for that, Chris? Brilliant. Also, um, because Chris was a Jehovah's Witness elder and uh, my experience of those people weren't very good, and I know it was the power structure that wasn't Chris, but still, he did do that. So if you want a drink during the interval... <laughs> And you're a feminist, you can ask Chris for one and he will have to buy you one. That's how it will work. That's how it will work. Um, are you ready for your final act? Please put your hands together and do lots of extraordinary woohooing for the one, the only, the guilty feminist favourite, Grace Petrie! Hi Brighton, how you doing? Yeah, for me, you know, there's, we all, you know, there was a lot of costs to the pandemic. But for me, <laughs> not seeing Taylor Swift at Glastonbury, that's really, uh, that's in the top, that's in the top five, to be honest. Uh, this is a song that I wrote uh, when I was driving uh, home from Glastonbury. I got a phone call uh, from my sister telling me that she had gone into labour with my first niece. And my niece is called Ivy, and I wrote this song about her, and the song is called Ivy, and it goes this. It was Glastonbury 2014 And me and my best friend We'd had an awesome festival then we got a call on Sunday about half past ten And it was back to the camp and it was back up at ten And it was saying goodbye to Billy Bragg as we went And telling our friends that we had somewhere to be Someone so much more important than all those VIPs It was your mum on the phone that rerouted us We got a hug goodbye from Phil Jupiter's and then we drove all night from Glastonbury to meet you home When you were ready to arrive, Ivy And I drove until the sun came up to beat you home All the way up the M5, Ivy And being early, the someone was at first for me But I thought my heart would burst if you got there before me And all the way home all I thought so I can't wait to tell you this story, Ivy Thanks for waiting for me And I can't wait to know the person you'll become and I can't wait to hear what music that you like And I can't wait to know the future as you'll make it And I wonder if I'll still be behind a mic Cause I mean maybe one day when you're my age Well maybe I'll be singing from that pyramid stage That once I drove all night from Glastonbury to meet you home When you were ready to arrive I'd be Drove 
until the sun came up to beat you home All the way up the M5 IV And being early, the someone was a first for me But I thought my heart would burst If you got there before me and all the way home All I thought was how I can't wait to tell you this story, Ivy Thanks for waiting for me Sabian and thanks for not coming during Dolly Parton <laughs> Oh believe me I when I say I would have driven right up the M5 to be there when you start living but I that I would be sad departing Cause how many times in life do you get to see Dolly Parton like Not that many <laughs> But I drove all night from Glastonbury to meet you home When you were ready to arrive I I drove until the sun came up to beat you home All the way up the M5 IV And being early, the someone was a first for me But I thought my heart would burst If you got there before me and all the way home All I thought was how I can't wait to tell you this story, IV And no, I can't wait to tell you this story, IV Tell you this story, Ivy. Thanks for waiting for me. Hello, Brighton Dome. Please welcome back to the stage, Deborah Francis White and Zoe Lanz! <laughs> hello, hello, hello! I've got news, gang. Chris came back. <laughs> if you love an audience, let them go. If they come back, they're yours. If they don't, it may be because you spent too much time talking to them in the first act. <laughs> Um, Chris, do you have an answer for Zoe and me about what you learnt? Did you come up with something? I, I did. Um, I did. It wasn't really what I've learned. Yes. Other than I thought that Grace Fetch's song just was so profound and really touched me. I thought that was amazing. Um, if, now, the people in the front are, are very, now, very won over to Chris. If Chris hadn't come here with a wife tonight, he would be leaving with one. <laughs> Because what he said was that Grace Petrie's song was so profound and so moving and uh, that just demonstrates to me how little men have to do to get a wonderful response. Like, it's just... What? He liked a song from a lesbian. Give this man a knighthood! The bar is low. The bar is very, very low. What we asked for was what he learned, but what, in fact, he did is gave us a review. And that... What he said was... No, no, no. This isn't about me. Let me rate in order the acts in the first half for how much they touched my soul. That's what we asked, Chris. That's not what we asked, is it? We asked, what did you learn? So what did you learn from Grace Petrie's song, Chris? And then Zoe will tell you whether or not what you learnt was good enough. I'm now, I'm now rating the audience. Just yeah. Chris. I don't, just know you, Chris. I don't know if you've okay. heard this before. But I discovered that Chris and I both used to be Jehovah's Witnesses, but he used to be an elder, which is one of the men that, men that told everyone what to do. Right. And sometimes formed committees to decide to shun people like me. Okay. So since then, the night hasn't picked up at all for Chris. You've got beef. <laughs> He's been loving it. He's been loving it. We've been, genuinely, we are joking. 
Did you, did you say so? I, I think I've got distracted and upstage by Chris. Were you also a Jehovah's Witness when I put the hand up? Are you one of the gang? Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Chris is delighted. You, sir, were you also an elder? No. Oh, well done you. Did you not reach out for greater responsibility? No. Were you a slacker? I was rebellious. Rebellious! High five. What's your name? Uh, Rob. Rebellious Rob. Big round of applause for Rebellious Rob. Okay, um... Are you single, rebellious Rob? Uh, well, I am now. My, my girlfriend dumped me. You are now your girlfriend dumped you? Yeah. What was... Oh, rebellious Rob. So you're rebellious. You never towed the line as a Jehovah's Witness. You didn't become an elder. Tell anyone else what to do. And here you are tonight, single, in a room full of women. If you can't pull in here, Rob, you can't pull in a women's prison. Now, that's not a feminist thing to say. Don't say that. That's not... That's too far, Rob. <laughs> oh, well done, right, Rob. Yeah, I love these boys. They're I know, lovely. I do too. No, I do, well too. Done. I do too. I'm normally so nice. I'm the nicest comedian in the world. Like I'm just lovely to people in the audience. It's, it's. There's something about Chris that I've just, in, I've just, I've enjoyed it so much, though, Chris. Such a sweet, gentle man. Chris. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> and Rob's a bit of rough. I'm quite enjoying Rob as well. This is, I'm getting all sorts from this evening. I wasn't expecting. Can you just describe nice. Rob as a bit of rough? Yeah, like a bit of rough. Do you enjoy that description, Rob? Yeah. That's good. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, excellent, excellent. I can see that you were rebellious. I can see, I can see. What, what age you were, were you born in? Yeah. What age did you leave? Um, when my wife cheated on me. <laughs> what age did you leave when my wife cheated on me? That's not, that's not an age. That's not a number of years. But it, well done getting a story out from that answer. <laughs> You're, so your wife cheated on you and now your girlfriend's dumped oh, you. <laughs> Rob, you are in need of a feminist. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Are you a feminist, Rob? I am, yeah. Why, well, no hesitation there! <laughs> Come on! I got so excited, Zoe. Zoe, I really want to ask you a question, which is this. Walking away, just walking away and saying no, saying mm -hmm. fuck it saying, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not down with this anymore. It's sort of the spirit of rebellious Rob. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, just imagine the spirit of rebellious Rob. But for the wider world, as a woman in the world, yep. as a feminist in the world, just going, sometimes just going, no. How do you feel about that sentiment? I embrace it wholeheartedly and tightly. I, um, and I think for me, it's more of... I, as I'm getting older, oh, just saying no is just... So delicious. Um, and I think that's because, as, as, as a woman in this business, I've worked really, really hard. Because yeah. I always felt like I had to. And I just said yes to everything. You know, do you want to go to Portsmouth for a bag of chips? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do a gig? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, I, you know, worked so hard. And I think, as a society as well, we, we sort of, we, we, we've got into that groove where if you weren't seen to be exhausted, you were somehow failing at life. Do you remember that pre-pandemic when you used to bump into your friends, you go, how you doing, Melissa? You're like, I'm fucking exhausted. <laughs> Me too. Why are you exhausted? Well, I've done yoga on Tuesday, take the kids to violin. I've got four jobs. I'm working in PR at the moment, but I'm also trying to do this. I'm doing a little start-up business from home. I'm doing that. I've got badminton on a Wednesday. I'm learning Mandarin. I'm fucking exhausted. It was like a competition, unless you were actually on the floor, like, I think I'm going to die from exhaustion. You weren't doing life properly. Yeah. And, you know, getting up at four to get on a fucking train to London to do, you know, and all of that rubbish, that rubbish. And uh, I think the, if there is a silver lining from pandemic, it's made us all go, do you know what, I can do a little bit less and it's okay. <laughs> And I will get a lot more out of life if I walk away from certain things that I don't want to do anymore. Mm -hmm. And just having that confidence to say, yeah. yeah. It's... I think as well as sort of freelancers, you get terrified that if you ever say no to a job, you'll never work again. And actually, that, it's not the case. The law, you know, it's simply not the case. But what you are doing by walking away, by, by um, you know, 
is, is, is creating more space for a better life to seep in. I love saying no now. I love it. I think there's a real confidence to it as well. I don't... And people... You know, now when I see people, I'm like, how are you, Zoe? Are you really busy? You're like, no, I've been picking the fluff out of my toes for a couple of days. <laughs> quite enjoyed it, to be honest with you. Because there's one thing I've learned. Is this, this is life here now. It's like you said, there is no past, there is no present, there is no future. There is only this minute. And if this minute is constantly achieving, 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 mm. strive, 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 for what? For what? For when? When's it going to stop? When you're, you know, oh, Melissa, I'm exhausted. Do you know that? Yeah. So I say no all the time now, and I'm a much happier person for it. So we lads, everybody, saying no for all of us. However, I was very much available this evening. <laughs> And it was a short bus ride away, so I said yes. Yes, it's true, it's true, because you live, you're a local Brightoner, aren't you? I'm, I'm her, 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 Hove. Her. We've, you've got some friends in. They've, we've, they've already cheered for Hove. Her. So this is an excellent gig for you to say yes to. An excellent gig for me to um, say yes to. Lovely audience. You get to sit down. It's nice in there. I'm yeah. loving this. There's a sort of kinkiness to this fabric that I'm <laughs> sort of... It's got a Bluetooth kinky. speaker on the side of this oh, yeah, sofa, it does, actually. Just, I've forgotten about that. You're doing very well. <laughs> yeah. We don't know you why. Do. I think it was cheaper to have the Bluetooth speaker than not have it. I think that's why. Have it? Yeah. Say yes to the Bluetooth speaker. Yes, that, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Say no to work, say yes to... The, this is... It's a bit vinyl, it's a bit... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> well, look, there's, we've got two empty chairs and we've got two guests, so I think we should bring them on. So our first guest has worked extensively in television, film and theatre. You will know her from everything from Doctor Who to Sided with Rosie uh, to The Hour to Moon Boy to 2012. Put your hands together for Jessica Hines! <laughs> Hello, Jessica Hines. Our second guest is Jessica Hines. Is oh. microphone working? Uh, that, why, while they make your microphone work. Oh, our maybe we can blue tooth with the sofa. <laughs> Hang on, I'll you push something. Yes, you get a is that work? Uh, Twizzle the, the knob. Off. It's on. Uh, our next guest. <laughs> you fixed it. That fixed it. <laughs> Our next guest is an author, journalist and screenwriter. They are a graduate of the Neiman Foundation Fellows Program at Harvard University and the Clarion West Writers Workshop. They are the author of eight books. Woo! Zoe's going to... more than I've read. Zoe's going <laughs> to... That... When they come out, Zoe might say, say no to more books, uh, including The Bitch Doctrine, Unspeakable Things and Penny Red. After several years away, uh, they have returned with their most urgent manifesto for change, sexual revolution, modern fascism, and the feminist fight back. Put your hands together and make incredible feminist fight back noises for the one and only Laurie Penny! <laughs> Laurie Penny. Is this one? Oh, yes, it is. No. I'm, oh, it's so wonderful to see you. Thank you. Last time I was up on the stage, I was, uh, it was my high school graduation. So, like, it's just like, at least I get to sit down, but I'm, like, I'm slightly, like, thinking I'm going to be given a certificate and then have to run away. So, do you, can I have a certificate? I, I will get, get, could somebody at the Brighton Dome please make sure Laurie Penny has a certificate it before she leaves the building tonight? Just, I'd love that. It doesn't, it can be for anything. Yeah, well, you could get a certificate of attendance for the Guilty Feminist. It'd be wonderful. Yeah, okay. We'll I'm make sure there's some, some kind of printed out participation certificate for Laurie Penny. Would you like one of those, Jessica Hines? Yes, please. Okay. Like, like badges when you're in the brownies. Yeah. Oh. Could we get a brownie badge for Zoe Lyons? I have a sewing badge. Would anyone else like anything while we're getting those? <laughs> now, listen, Laurie, I'm desperate to talk to you about your new book, and so we can all have a lovely chat about it, because I think it just sounds incredible. You say in the book that there's a new sexual revolution happening. Can you please explain what that is? So, um, the principle of the book is that, that there is a sexual revolution that has been happening, like not like the sexual revolution of the 60s, but a broader sea change in how people relate to each other, gender and power, and it's, people are only just starting to notice it because it's mainly about the... Like the change in power balance between chiefly men and women, chiefly within heterosexuality, and the fact that... Well, basically, look, I wrote 
a 300-page book about this, but it basically boils down to the fact that women have real options now, and they can say no to the traditional forms of partnership and parenthood and the kinds of work that women are always expected to take on. And, um, and it turns out that some people would rather do other things with their one life than engage in a system that, you know, if everybody here presumably knows people who are, you know, who are in relationships that aren't working out and who are struggling with multiple jobs and being parents and within, in a system where, frankly, it is as hard as it's ever been to have and raise kids and build families. Some people are just going, I would rather not. I would rather just, it's Bartleby with the Scrivener. It's like, I would prefer not to. And like, when I was, like, little and hearing about feminism, it was like the 90s, early aughts, and people, it was all like, women can do ev anything, you know, we can do anything, we can have, have it all, and it all is, you know, a job, husband, definitely husband, um, children, 2.5, and it was just like, even back then, I just remember thinking, that sounds exhausting, when am I going to get to go on Tumblr? Like, what am I going to get to? It's the, the have it all doesn't mean you ha It turned out to be, no, women have to do it all. Mm. We have to do every single thing. And I think more and more people are looking at it and, and saying, this is a bad deal. And men are not changing. I'm sorry. Like, if you look at the... There was a really interesting study recently about the reasons why they did exit interviews for women who are freezing their ex. So this is people who really want to have children... Um, biological children of their own, but they, um, but they don't think they're feeling ready for it. And uh, people were expecting them to say, oh, it's because I want to, you know, work on my career. And they did say that, but the number one reason was not being able to find a suitable partner. For not being able to find a to suitable find partner. To find a suitable partner. And, like, look, I I'm sorry to the straight guys in the audience, of which I assume there are about five, but, like, <laughs> hi. Like, it, this probably Have doesn't apply to you. Have you met Rebellious Rob? Yeah. <laughs> to the yeah, I mean, right. you don't, yeah, hi, Rob. Like, this is not, it's not about you, but it is kind of a bit, because, like, look. Sorry, Rob. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> a tough week. Like, okay, basically, heterosexuality is a hostile work environment, and women are mass on strike until conditions improve. <laughs> Laurie, I read this week, and it was it was one of those online things. It was a bit like I don't know if you ever see those things that say, "Yeah, am I being the asshole, or I have a problem here, or you know, is it is it me, or whatever?" And it was a man who said, "My wife and I are both high earners, and we've kept our finances separate. We earn about the same, mm -hmm. um, but we've been we're married. We now want to have a child. We now want to have a child." And uh, she sat down with me and said, "Okay, you need to pay me fifty grand." Because that's Brilliant. what it's going to take. You know, I have to take six months off. I'm going to get a certain amount of maternity leave. But then he said she had like a huge ring binder of if I do I need to take another... I love this woman. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. And he was like, oh, it's, it's a turn off for me because, you know, you're saying I have to pay you to make our child. And she was like, he said, and then she doubled down. That's what he said. He was furious. And, and she had this ring binder and she said, well, if I do need to take another 12, six months off, there's this. And she's saying, look, there's this toll on my body. She's not charging him for the toll on the body, but she's like, why should I also take a financial cut as well as doing all of this. And she also, in the binder, it says that they have to keep splitting the housework and the, there's an agreement about the thing. And I was like, this woman's my hero. Well, like, who is, firstly, like, who is this amazing woman? I want to meet her. But, I mean, yes, the, that is absolutely the principle. But also, like, look, the kind of person who would come to you with that ring binder, like, was there nothing in their relationship previously that suggested you'd married that sort of person? <laughs> I feel like... <laughs> I feel like there should have been signs. Like she, she would have like this is the kind of person who like prints off every single Yelp review and like it's like surely this is part of what like laminated their yeah, marriage yeah, absolutely, certificate. Absolutely, I love it. Women now have a real, genuinely meaningful choice between any relationship with any man at all. Like when we're talking about the conditions of heterosexuality here, which, like, despite actually being from Brighton, I still find myself enmeshed in. Sorry to, like, my husband, who's not here. <laughs> Sorry, babe. <laughs> not you. Kind of you. No. Um, but um, the women are now have, like, a meaningful option. We could, there is not the choice between 
like absolute penury and social stigma forever or like any man at all will do. And the, and the mm. idea that any man at all will do is still hugely current in society. Look, I mean, look at all these, you know, the, the incels and the young men. Some of them are really young men. Like, oh, God, I've never had a girlfriend. You're 17. Calm down. Yeah. Like, but people who are so full of rage and entitlement that they think they deserve a woman in their lives, it doesn't matter who, really, to fix all of the problems that capitalism has, has created for them. And, like, it, it's created them for women too, guys, sorry. But um, the entitlement and everybody, like, the people in the news and, like, commentators have been, whilst obviously condemning the horrible violence, they've been like, well, I mean, have you, you've seen people, like, write columns saying, you know, don't these guys have a point, though? I mean, aren't women being a bit too picky? And, you know, you're going to be left on the shelf? It's this sort of weird brinkmanship game. And, and, but actually, the impact of that violence, of like the, kind of the extremism, is much less than what has been quietly going on for a long, long time, which is women just walking away and just saying no. I mean, you look at like my generation, who are the people who are having to decide right now if we want to form partnerships and bring kids into the world, they're just, the birth rates have been going down and they've just gone like that. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows what to do because they didn't plan for this. Nobody planned for this. The, the only plan any like nominally Western government has come up with for reversing the birth rate decline is to ban abortion. That is it. And like, yeah, this is the, like, I'm glad we're talking about this walking away. Because I think it's time that the discussion around feminism moved on from just how do we juggle everything and do everything that's expected of us. To how do we do... Rant to end. No, but, yeah, to how do we do nothing well. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or not even well at all. I love, like, what is it? There's obviously figures on the, the housework gap and the childcare gap. It's very interesting to look at the self-reported figures and how they differ between like male partners and female partners, how much people think they're doing. But what nobody focuses on is the leisure gap. And actually, that is where men in straight partnerships come out way ahead. The oh. thing that women don't have is time to, for themselves. They don't have time to, look, yeah. I, I read obsessively, when would I get time to read? When it, I just want to sit by the radiator, eating crackers and doom scrolling. That's what I want oh. to do. That's all I want to do. And I want hours in my life to do that. I'm sorry, it's, maybe that's lazy. I, I, I think it's my right to be lazy sometimes. Jessica Hines. Yes. You are in an opposite sex relationship, if you don't mind me saying. I think I have, last and, time I checked. And you have children. Yes, uh, I do. How do you feel about what Laurie's saying? Oh, I think it's fascinating. It's so interesting. It's, it's the, I feel it's the beginning of a very important conversation, really. Did you feel when you were younger that you had the option to stay single slash not I have children? I felt that was my destiny. Um, what, to stay single and not have children? Most certainly, yeah. Oh, I mean, really? Yeah, I had not planned for this, No. No, this, that was, there was no expectation. I had no expectation. And then it just happened? Yeah. Yeah, that's basically That's how they it. get you. <laughs> they got me to left field. Everyone run. Do you, do you Some see... Some of them are very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> do you see in your life as a mother... Yes. ...that there is a gap? I'm not asking you about your own personal relationship, but just yeah. in the culture, in the community of mums and dads and parents of all sorts, do you see this, this leisure gap? And do you feel like feminism has an obligation to tell women that they can put two fingers up to the whole thing? Um, I think, I feel that what Laurie's saying is really, really right. I think that what she's describing is so accurate. It's mm. exactly what's happening. And um, it's fascinating because she's talking about a social um, phenomenon that um, from kind of an objective and kind of intellectual perspective. And I'm deeply biased, but thank you. I'm glad but, I... But, you know, you're, you're looking at the situation from a distance, which is interesting. And I suppose that when you're kind of living it, it's, <clears throat> it's a different experience. But I've always thought about feminism, having grown up um, around a lot of very, very feminists. I mean, I, I sort of, you know, kind of grew up in the era where people were... There were, the, there were the Wilds living in Leeds, and that was a group of women who decided to live without men. You know, they decided that men were were, were, were surplus yeah, yeah, yeah. to requirements, so they took their kids 
including their sons, and went and set up a commune in Leeds, you know, very kind of valiantly um, to prove a point, you know. Um, and, of course, there's um, Shulamith Firestone, who, who a lot of her writing and, and rhetoric is about um, the, the, you know, some of the fundamental issues around, um, you know, men and women. Um, and, I, and I think as a product and a child of you know, kind of 80s, 90s feminism, which came out of 70s, 60s feminism, um, growing up around a lot of single women with children who were really, really, um, you know, struggling because of uh, their relationships having failed, sometimes because men had just walked out on them, um, not leaving them any choice. Sometimes it might have been a choice they made, but nonetheless, they were alone and struggling and a lot of that rhetoric and a lot of those conversations were about, you know, men. What are we going to do about men? And I think as a child, where that led me was to just idolise men out of all proportion. So I became a kind of backlash against that, really. You know, everything mostly in nature is about coupling. And surely the objective is to learn how to love each other and couple in love and in acceptance and understanding, and is that not the end game? I don't know. I, I'm not sure, but because <laughs> I think now polyamory and open relationships are becoming more socially acceptable, yeah. more people are accepting, wanting that model or a single model, but I think certainly a lot of people want a relationship with one intimate person, that's clear. So we, can I ask, does this gap, how does it play out in the lesbian community? Um, Do, well, like, is there one if some one person's caring for the child, or like, is there other gaps in other ways? I don't know. I mean, I can't really speak for the entire lesbian community. <laughs> but so I am asking you to speak for the I entire am, lesbian I'm community not, of Hove and Brighton. <laughs> uh, although, although I am their leader. <laughs> We do it on a timeshare basis. We're very, we're, we're very uh, forward-thinking in that way. I was just, I, it, it, it's funny. There are times when I, you know, when growing up, I, I never saw my homosexuality as an advantage. But as an older person, I really genuinely yeah, do, because there are so many things that I just don't have to consider. Because I've never, because I, because I knew from the age of ten that I would never fit into any sort of. Um, normal template anyway so my brain just didn't I didn't have I didn't have to compute that so I have what I would describe as a, a very uh, I'm going to say selfish yet happy life because I have done exactly what I want when I want well done <laughs> and, um, um, <laughs> I'm getting from the wings that we have to bring on our final act. But while she's setting up, I think Laurie's got one more thing to say. Uh, please welcome to the stage. Uh, she is uh, uh, my favourite and yours, the incredible Jess Robertson. Yeah, well, Jess sets up. I, I wanted to, like, what you said was so important about love. And there's just one thing. It's that... I think straight women, and I'm sorry like, to, to monopolise the conversation and make it straight, but that is how people are kind of... That's what is said to straight women from such a young age, is you have to do these things or you won't be loved. And that gets you. It is one of the most oppressive things because everybody wants that. It's exactly like you said. And if you make love conditional on behaving in certain ways and doing this kind of work... And that, at the moment, I think is what the revolution is about. It's saying that like, you deserve to be loved, but not at any cost. And that's it. That's it. Amen. Thank you, Laura Penny. <laughs> Jess Robinson. Hello. You are certainly a woman who deserves to be loved at all costs. You're very kind. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on stage. And it's you've sort of pleasure. come into... We're so excited. We're sort of... Hello. ...mainstream conversation. Uh, Jess, what are you going to do for us tonight? Well, um, it's, by the way, amazing to be back at The Guilty Feminist. I absolutely love it. And I, I grew up um, performing and singing in front of my grandma and her friends, who were all very glamorous women, all very strong, very opinionated. I feel like I've come full circle tonight, I'm not going to lie. Um, my final song uh, was inspired by the wonderful Jessica Hines and her incredible speech about being strong. And uh, when I heard her do that for the first time, when I heard you do that at the Albert Hall, I found it so moving because 
spending my time around very brilliant, uh, strong women made me sort of question my place. I've got the knee shakes. Made me question my place in the world and, and, and you know, stuff like that. So anyway, <laughs> very articulate. This is called Strong, and uh, it's all about my pelvic floor. <laughs> What am I? A person with a heart A heart that keeps beating on and on Try to steal it or even break it But you know what? I can take it Cause my heart is all my own And I am strong What am I? It's a temple, my private path and all Mine to nurture or to tease with Do whatever the fuck I please with Cause my body is my own And I am strong I am strong I am strong in the world it's not clear to me thank you so so much can I just say I've just had such a wonderful night I've cried about five times it's just so amazing <laughs> being back I just like sitting in the wings and watching people and watching you respond and watching them respond to you and it's just been so amazing and I'm just really happy <laughs> thank you for coming out could you please this is the first show and you all came out and thank you could you please spread the word if everyone could like tell a person tweet 
Facebook, whatever, just tell people we're back and we're out. We've got so many more dates around the country. We're in Norwich tomorrow night, but we are literally everywhere. And we're going to be at the Hammersmith Apollo for our last show in October. Book for that now. Uh, we've got Hannah Gadsby. You can jump on the train and come to uh, London to see Hannah Gadsby, me and her in conversation with her book. It's the only live event she's doing and the only podcast she's doing. Uh, so please, please, please come along and get involved in those things. Thank you so much for being an amazing audience, Brighton. We've really loved you. And please, can I have a huge, huge, huge round of applause for the incredible Jessica Hines? <laughs> Sakisa, who had to leave. Grace Petrie, who's on the A40. The wonderful Zoe Love. people who work here. Thank you every single one of you for coming out. And finally, a big round of applause for Chris. <laughs> Rachel and Rebellious Rob, it wouldn't have been the same without them. You've been absolutely wonderful. I've been Deborah Francis White. We've been the Guilty Feminists. Good night. You have been listening to the Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Zoe Lyons, and our very special guests, Jessica Hines, Sakisa, and Laurie Penny music from Grace Petrie and Jess Robinson. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Salinsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Stuart, Gina, Bjorn, Jody, and everyone at the Brighton Dome, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. I was on the BAFTA committee when she won the BAFTA probably just one of them after she's one actually she'll tell you if if I've got that wrong I'm convinced she'll tell you when she comes out uh but because she is an absolute I don't think you're meant to say you're on the BAFTA committee edit that out of the podcast it's not allowed I won't be invited back can you not tweet that you're genuinely not meant to say that shit I am never gonna get a BAFTA but she's probably got more than what she's probably got loads I think she has it loads at least The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.